All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to day four of our 2023 annual grants program public panels. My name is Nikki Kirk, and I'm the Director of Community Investment with the Indie Arts Council, and I will serve as our panel moderator today. The Indie Arts Council's mission is to foster meaningful engagement in the arts by nurturing a culture where artists and arts organizations thrive, and our creative economy is thriving. Across our sector, we see evidence of growth, innovation, increasing equity, and new partnerships. For 36 years, the City of Indianapolis has entrusted the Arts Council to invest public funds supporting the community impact that's generated by our nonprofit arts and cultural organizations. These awards are determined through an independent panel review that is inclusive, accessible, transparent, and advances the city's racial equity priorities. This week, our panelists will review a record 87 applications that will result in a total of 1.5 million in general operating support grants. The city increased the amount by 15% so that more organizations could apply and receive funding. We're pleased that 16 new organizations applied this year, along with organizations that have been a part of the program for the entire 36 years. As the panelists discuss the applications, we'll hear examples of the impact these organizations are having on artists and audiences in our community. It's also important to recognize that organizations funded through the program create $440 million in annual economic impact support 30,000 jobs, and serve 8 million residents and visitors. On behalf of the Indie Arts Council, I want to thank each applicant for their contributions to our community. And I also want to extend our appreciation to our panelists for inv investing their time and expertise into this process. And a final thanks to our board, our grants committee, and our staff for their tireless work to advance our mission every day. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists for today's session. Ebony Chuku, Walder Foundation's Associate Program Officer of Performing Arts. Ray Gargano, Arts Waves VP of Community Investments. Sarah Lindgren, Fund for the Arts VP of Community Investment and Support. And Rochelle Riley, City of Detroit Director of Arts and Culture. Rochelle is unable to join us for our first portion today, but may join us later on. In her stead, Cheney Jones, Indie Arts Council's Director of Equity Partnerships, will read her comments out as we go. Today, our panelists will do a public review of applications in levels one, two, and three. As I noted, the panelists will not verbally announce their scores, but today's comments do reflect those scores. If a panelist states something that conflicts with factual information presented in your organization's application, please use the applicant clarification form to correct their statements. My colleague, Zach Patterson, who is working behind the screen this week supporting the grant panel process, will post that in the chat box. If clarification is deemed necessary, necessary for any part of the review, panelists will be able to revisit scoring prior to final submission of their grant scores. Please remember there's no opportunity to directly answer questions from the audience. The form is for fact, factual clarification only. If you do have questions or comments about the panel discussion or process, we ask that you direct those questions to grants at indiearts.org beginning next week, Monday, April 17th. The panel review process is being live streamed on Zoom and YouTube from 1 to 5 p.m. today with a 15 minute break in the middle. You can find the schedule for today's review on our website. This session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube account. Our amazing panelists have reviewed all of today's applications and will engage in the group feedback session. Once all applications are publicly reviewed, we will convert the panel scores into a percentile ranking. By May 5th, applicants will be notified of their award amount and their, and their percentile ranking. As a reminder, the panel scores all applications in three main areas, artistic merit, organizational capacity, community impact, and all three criteria center racial and socioeconomic equity. And with that, let's begin. Today's first application is a request from Big Car Collaborative. Their mission is to bring art to people and people to art, sparking creativity and lives to com support communities. They were founded in 2010. They have a 2022 operating income of 1,448,091. They have 16 board members, eight full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 with 72,963. And with that, I will let Cheney uh, read out Rochelle's comments. Great, thank you, Nikki. I'll be reading Rochelle's notes. She starts with, what an amazing journey over the course of 20 years from a house to a cultural behemoth. Growing from a single home in Fountain Square to community spaces around the city showed a commitment to connection and community spaces. 
and growing from an old tire shop to 20 buildings in a one block campus is evidence of an exceptional leadership. Bicar also should be committed for focusing on affordable housing for artists, something that nationally artists have made clear that they need and that artists will co-own the space is exciting. I also might cite that Bicar is one of only 32 regional regranting organizations in the country that's making it able to better support local artists. When I read that the next move is to expand into an adjacent 46,000 square foot building featuring artist studios, performance space, um, exhibition space, and a cafe, I had no doubt that it would be successful. What Big Car did during the pandemic, again, was a sign of solid leadership that kept moving. Um, she closes with saying, Big Car also has shown not just a written commitment, but an actual embrace of diversity by having leaders of color since its inception and not seeing diversity only in black and white one of the best examples I've seen. That's Rochelle's notes. Thank you, Janie. Sarah, anything you'd like to add? Um, sure, thank you, Nikki. I'll add a few notes. Um, like Rochelle said, it's it's an innovative organization and, and the focus on um, being artist-led and, and housing for artists is really exciting. Um, and just to push that point a little bit further, the really interesting model where they're including that investment in their um, revenue strategies, I think is really interesting and exciting um, and innovative. Um, strong partnerships, especially like the partnership with the neighborhood associations um, and um, the groups being very intentional with uh, accessible presentation of art uh, for their neighbors. Um, and just wanna recognize that their work is recognize that their work is being recognized um, nationally by uh, relevant media. That's pretty exciting as well. Um, the application describes the um, artistic vision very well. There's a lot happening with it, but it's described really well. Um, the only thing I wanted to know a little bit more when they, when they referred to programs being co-led with the neighbors in the community, I, I wished I had a little bit more information about how the co-leading was happening, um, a little bit more detail there. Um, and um, really appreciate the artist stipends versus work for sale. Um, I think that is really uh, great to read about as well. Um, that the investment is both in artist and community and that the community is not being expected to pay for art in order to experience it. Um, I'll wrap up here, I just had a few more. Um, Rochelle already mentioned the subgranting, so I'll just second that. Um, and the fact that the board represents um, a variety of relevant fields of expertise, um, as well as um, diversity in the demographics reported on the board, um, and just uh, recognize the broad range of funding sources represented. And that's it. Great, thank you. Any other panel comments? I would just say um, after with 20 years of, of history with them, I'd like to see a little bit about the outcomes for the artists and how they've developed and how they've benefited, even if it's just anecdotal. Thank you. Any additional comments? Great, if there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. As previously announced, all scores will be kept confidential. Our next application is a request from Madam Walker Legacy Theater, Legacy Center, sorry. The mission of the Madam Walker Leg Legacy Center is to inspire, engage, and empower individuals in our culturally diverse community. Their strategic vision is to engage diverse audiences and promote creativity and entrepreneurial and artistic expression. They had a 2022 operating income of 1,493,214. They have 12 board members, four full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022, 32,294. And with that, I will ask Sarah to be in the discussion. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so this application had a really clear and strong organizational profile. Um, uh, the introduction that was provided in that space of the application was really useful. Um, it's clear that the organization has a lot of strong partnerships um, and appreciate their focus on free and artistic programming. I really appreciated the testimonials in the narrative um, to really give a picture of those experiencing uh, what the programs are like. Um, and they're obviously receiving some great national recognition. Um, I had a little bit of, I'm 
unclear or questions about um, the audience numbers were not reported and there didn't seem, I didn't see any explanation in the notes area. So um, a little unclear there. Um, let's see, uh, the artistic leadership is really strong. Um, um, excited to see what comes next in the leadership in that area. It looked like they were in the transition space at the time of writing the application at least. Um, um, appreciate that they're engaging both local and national uh, artists and multidisciplinary artists. Um, in terms of the organization, um, um, recognizing that they're receiving some supplemental income from tax credits and office rentals. So, you know, a diverse uh, sources of income, which is good. Um, it looks, I had some notes about the current year budget was not reported. So um, that left some questions about trying to make the comparison in the two years of the budget. Um, and it looks like maybe there was a, a typo or an error in the total operating expenses, which was a little hard to understand. Um, but board and staff um, appear to have strong leadership and um, the reported demographics are very much in line with the mission of the organization, um, strong and qualified leadership. So that's it for me. Great, thank you. Ebony, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks. Um, I really appreciated uh, reading a lot about Madam Walker Legacy Center. Um, I think it was very clear throughout the application that there's a deep community focus on impact for the organization. Um, I think uh, it was really um, great that the organization was able to provide a lot of free programming, especially during kind of the height of the pandemic, um, really retaining and um, that kind of base of, of community building, um, even even though a lot of programming had to be virtual. So I thought that was really beautiful to see. Um, I loved the um, efforts that they're working on to provide professional development to local artists. Um, and, you know, those opportunities through the, the collaborative programming, ec economic literacy, entre entrepreneurial empowerment. I thought that those were really great to um, hear about um, as providing kind of both professional tools, but also an artistic platform for, for their cultural curators. Um, so I thought that that program was really interesting to read about. Um, just one, you know, can't stress enough, it's always refreshing to see an all black, all woman uh, leadership team really pioneering uh, the organization. So um, that was really uh, beautiful to read about. Um, and yeah, it's good to see that they're they're looking to hire uh, programs and outreach manager, I think, uh, specifically to kind of help retain uh, and build audience, because I think that that was something that was kind of uh, clearly reflective over the application of, of just making sure that they're able to kind of build and retain that audience. So it's, it's good to see that they're really uh, investing in a position to kind of help with that development. Thank you. Any other panel comments? If there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. All right, our next application is a request from Indianapolis Opera Company. The mission of the Indianapolis Opera is to educate, inspire, and entertain through the creation and presentation of musical storytelling for our diverse Hoosier community. They were founded in 1975. They had a 2022 operating income of $1,528,800. They have 24 board members, four full-time employees, and audience served in 2022 was 2,150. And with that, I will ask Cheney to read out Rochelle's comments. Thanks, Nikki. Rochelle opens by saying that opera's commitment to artistic excellence and diversity in programming operations and personnel is evident in their application. Choosing very specific methods to embrace cultural art forms and new audiences is clear by its flexibility. An example of this is their embrace of Angela Brown's leadership. And while I do understand the sincere power of this statement from the opera, I'm going to begin quote, we make sure that we listen to people and their vocal gift, not concerning ourselves with color or gender identity, end quote. Every artist organization must pay attention to color and gender identity, even if not announced until asked for support. And in reference to our sustainability, some important parts of their programming are the opera's residencies and master classes, and this ensures continued growth of the organization. The level of individual and corporate support is impressive. It shows that they do not rely um, strictly on foundations, and it was inspiring to see an expected growth in ticket sales, showing its uh, comeback from the pandemic. 
Another note, Rochelle mentioned that it's embraced diversity from its inception, presenting women of color as a lead in its first opera since 1975. It has 60% of its residents and art, excuse me, their resident artists identify as BIPOC or LGBTQ over the past four years. And they're also creating additional partnerships with MLK Center. Rochelle then closes with saying, the opera knows how to reach out to everyone doing open calls in minority media and on college campuses. I also appreciated the additional information about its leaders so we could get a sense of who is leading our opera, a complete application that showed tangible evidence of excellence. Thank you, Jamie. Any additional comments? I'll just add one about the way that they document um, diversity and putting everyone together in the same bucket as other. And so I'm not sure if that was intentional or if that was just for the grant application, but it would be nice to see it broken out a little bit more. Thank you. Any additional comments? I'll add just a really brief one that I, I just wanted to recognize the resident artist program and that that was really um, an exciting part of the application. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, hey, if there's no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. All right, our next application is a request from the Athenaeum Foundation. The mission of the Athenaeum Foundation is to preserve and tr a treasured historic landmark that welcomes all to nurture a sound mind, a sound body through the arts, culture, wellness, and community. They were founded in 1991. They had a 2022 operating income of 1,573,018. They have 19 board members, five full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 was 100,486. And with that, I will ask Ebony to begin the discussion. Thanks, Nikki. Um, yeah, so it was great to uh, read about um, a kind of um, a space that is really uh, available for a lot of different artistic organizations to um, be a part of. Um, I appreciated the choice uh, that Athenaeum was focusing on producing works, productions, exhibitions that are outside main, the mainstream realm. I just wish that there was a little bit more clarification on how that or the organization defines mainstream. Um, but it was really nice to read uh, the examples of artists that um, that they have partnered with um, over the years um, through the chalkboard program. Um, I was curious, uh, to know how the pay structure typically is for artists and organizations. You, you talked about, uh, the organization talked about how they receive a discount in space rental, but I wasn't sure. I was more curious about um, how the artists are actually compensated after performance. Like what is the ratio balance between the ticket sales and, and what goes back to the artists and the organizations? Um, Looking over their strategic plan, I really appreciated um, seeing a priority of tactics that are really geared toward community input and feedback um, to really to kind of help uh, reach the goal of, of diversifying the demographics of the visitors and the tenants. Um, I also really appreciated seeing uh, a really purposeful, purposeful step um, in curating programming programmatic partnerships sorry, <laughs> um, that uh, kind of help with uh, achieving that outcome as well. Um, I think the organization is really at a good start with trying to prioritize DEI efforts. Um, and, and it'll be interesting to see how it continues to really incorporate that within the organizational culture or the practices and, and the frameworks that they're building um, uh, as they move forward. Um, I was very also curious about kind of uh, with such a small staff size and such large scale changes, how the organization is, is looking to kind of really go about that. Um, I know they mentioned uh, some work partnering with uh, No Exit. And so I was also kind of curious about if that was an alliance or if if that was a merger or like, I wasn't sure what the dynamic was um, between No Exit and f and like if no exit was a part of Athenaeum or there are separate entities. It was a little unclear to me. Um, and uh, let's see. Something that I, I noticed also in the strategic plan that I just wanted to mention is that I was a little unsure about kind of uh, 
the time frame. Like I, I noticed it was from 2020 to 2023, but we're in 2023. And so I think maybe it would have been a little helpful to understand maybe where the progress was from some of these tactics. Um, because a lot of these um, percentages that you're looking to increase from were really large. And so I wasn't sure where in in that part of your progress that you have either made it to that and you've reached your goal or you um, were still in the progress of that or, you know, so it would have been helpful to know kind of where where the organization is with some of the tactics. Um, yeah, uh, I think that those are my big things. Thank you. Ray, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I um, had the same question about timing, but I think um, any of the organizations that found the time during the pandemic to step back and reevaluate um, strategy and mission, um, it was a great opportunity to expand programming for the organization and the community, um, especially here, adding more open events and exploring increasing diversity across all programs, staff, and board. Um, the one thing I will say, I, I encourage you to look at access definition or look at it in a broader sense, especially when you're managing buildings and festivals for the public. How do you accommodate everybody? Thanks. Great, thank you. Any additional comments? Great, if there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. All right, our next application is a request from Harrison Center. The Harrison Center seeks to be a catalyst for renewal in the city of Indianapolis by fostering awareness, appreciation, and community for arts and culture. They were founded in 2003, they had a 2022 operating income of 1,579,056. Um, they have 13 board members, five full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 was 60,000. With that, I will ask Ray to begin the discussion. Thanks. So um, right from the beginning, I saw that the target audience was emerging artists and emerging patrons. Um, it took me a while to, through reading the, the application to actually get a sense of what exactly the center was doing. Um, so I would just say as a, as a so when you're writing an application, um, think about people who don't know you, um, if that's the situation. I think through thoughtful and playful art exhibits, neighborhood-centric programs, open studio nights, community theater, concerts, and festivals, that it appears that the artists have found community here and help create a sense of community for Indianapolis overall. Um, exhibits for local artists and residencies with a focus on BIPOC relationships, hiring new staff for creative placemaking this year were all good signs. Um, Overall, building capacity for artists, especially artists of color, is a great uh, addition to the community. Um, and including uh, a diverse board with people with disabilities on the board and um, a studio audience, artists and classes for people with disabilities. Um, the Summer Academy is interesting with a large and a diverse enrollment meant to grow a new generation of diverse patrons, free of charge and open to all Indian high school students for five weeks, among their other programs. And they seem to have a lot of notable accomplishments. While the focus is on local artists, um, they also host 10 week and 48 hour residencies, which I thought was interesting programming. They do point out that they have an interesting space with a karaoke elevator. So that's something that I would like to see. Um, the ED is focusing on building an endowment, a diverse board and new, a new strategic plan in 2023, which will continue to prioritize diversity. And after reading the application, that seems to be where they need to be. That's it. Great, thank you. Any additional panel comments? Um, I'll add a few, Nikki. Um, so I wanted to um, say I thought it was a really interesting and positive partnership with the Housing and Community Development Corporation uh, work. So um, 
that was really exciting. Um, would have loved to hear more detail about that. So um, that's something to focus on or build on. And then just a, a question um, in a few places in the application, it was hard to understand whether the investment, the budget is um, exactly behind what the um, described priorities are. So um, that's a little bit of area to um, you know, think about for future applications to make sure that the what is being stated as the priorities is um, backed up with the investment in the budget. Thank you. Any other comments? Great. If there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. Okay, our next application is a request from Heartland Film. Heartland Film's mission is to curate, promote, and celebrate thoughtful and engaging films from diverse perspectives. They were founded in 1999. They had a 2022 operating income of 1,709,616. They have 27 board members, 11 full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 was 29,054. And with that, I will ask Ebony to begin the discussion. Thank you. Um, so uh, upon reading the uh, organization or Heartland Films application, um, it was great to see that they're committed to DEI efforts for the organization. Um, it's very evident that they're looking to promote films with a, a, a diverse um, array of narratives and artists, but I was, I was curious about how the organization is trying um, to be intentional about making that process more accessible for filmmakers of uh, non-dominant backgrounds and identities. So that was just kind of something that I was um, interested in as well, like, and more so locally as well. Um, I think, uh, let's see. Um, it's like, it's also very clear, I think that uh, as an organization, they're creating gateways of opportunities to allow filmmakers to engage uh, with, uh, Heartland through, you know, potential partnerships uh, with other organizations, which I think is great, providing connections and opportunities for um, different artists. Um, uh, I was uh, curious about how they're thinking about really channeling that pipeline from learning about film in schools to be able being able to engage with uh, the organization to really build up kind of that next generation of independent filmmakers. Um, uh, they started talking about uh, uh, a bit about this with the Dream Alive program, but I would have loved to hear a little bit more about how that is structured. Um, I uh, I really appreciate the the focus that Heartland Film does on creating and programming that's geared toward early career uh, filmmakers. Um, and I was uh, curious to see if uh, the artists receive any support from the organization for their work, or is it is it that just Heartland Film is providing them with the platform? I wasn't sure if they like also provided resources for these artists um, in order to kind of develop their films, or if it's just that the artists have to come in with the final product and then submit it to Heartland Film. Um, I, uh, let's see. Um, I think, uh, again, it's great that they're, uh, that they have an international film festival, because I think it's really great to showcase cultural identities um, to kind of create and promote better understanding of, of cultural beliefs and, and opinions um, uh, from other countries to ours. So I think that that's a, a beautiful way that, um, that an organization can kind of uh, create those narratives and, and really um, uplift those narratives. So I thought that was great. Um, it seems like the, the organization's really taken a lot of time to solidify uh, their operational team. Um, and so they're sustainable in implementing their program uh, offerings to the community. So that, that was really nice to see. Um, I think uh, there was a um, an incorrect financial statement that was um, submitted uh, by the organization. So um, that was something uh, to note. Um, and yeah, I think that's where that's what I have for, for Heartland. Thank you. Um, Cheney, do you want to read out Rochelle's comments? Um, yes, yeah, she starts with saying that Heartland's success can be measured by the breadth of its programming and rise in national stature. Congratulations on movie maker Mag naming Indie Shorts as a top 20 shorts film festival in the world last year. 
Um, she also noted that they have an expectation for more individual donations in the new year than last. Um, and something that she observed similar to you, Ebony, is that the festival is lacking in diversity, both in its leadership and perhaps in its audience. And she closes by saying, as it continues this mission to provide cultural diverse offerings to cultural diverse, oh, excuse me, cultural diverse audiences, it must also show ways that there show evidence of this. Thank you. Any additional panel comments? I'll just piggyback on that. Um, I agree. One comment they made a couple of times was they're trying to get bring in more patrons and new patrons, which I agree is a good thing. But um, they sort of assume that that brings diversity. So uh, just like Rochelle mentioned, how, what's the strategy behind that and how do you measure it or track it? Thank you. Any other comments? I'll add one really small one, and this is like a really kind of small detail, but just um, something that the organization um, might make clear to strengthen uh, their applications is, you know, talking about investing in artists, but in the budget, you know, it reflects um, a specific amount of income that is through call for entry fees. Um, that I assume that means artists are paying in order to submit their film to the festival. Um, and then that there is um, funding that goes out um, in awards and prizes, but the call for entry seems to exceed what goes out in the prizes. So that could be um, um, an unfair comparison that maybe I just didn't understand, but um, if, um, if that could be made clear or um, make clear that they're investing in artists um, um, or make clear what their investment in artists is, that would be that would be really helpful. Thank you. Any other comments? Great. There's no further comments. Please update your scores in the system if needed. Okay, our next application is a request from Phoenix Theater. Uh, Phoenix Theater Cultural Center dedicates itself to commissioning, cultivating, and producing new and contemporary plays and artistic experiences, bolsters dialogue that explores the social, political, and cultural issues of our time, and champions inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility for all. They were founded in 1983. They have a 2022 operating income of 1,887,873. They have 22 board members, nine full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 was 10,840. With that, I will ask Sarah to begin the discussion. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so the, um, this organization, the application made it really clear that they're having a strong uh, community impact. Um, examples of that are um, impacting the community through um, accessibility performances um, and using, oh, and through partners using their venue. Um, the tickets are at an affordable pricing structure. They have strong partnerships. Uh, the partnerships are mutually beneficial. That's made clear in the application. Um, uh, the collaboration with uh, the or other organizations using their venues, the collaboration on marketing and sharing revenue was uh, really interesting uh, to read about. Um, the partnerships really indicate that it's a welcoming organization, so I want to recognize that. Um, the education programs are clearly aligned with the mission and very focused. I appreciated that. Uh, very interesting IDEA work. Um, they're going into the next phase. Uh, that they described, I'm not quoting, but they described it as um, shifting authority and resources into the hands of BIPOC people in the community. So I thought that was really um, interesting. Um, it looks like they're um, still working on the audiences and, and as in terms of what is reported for their external demographics, um, still working um, for those audiences to reflect uh, the demographics of the community. Um, I really appreciated also the Sanford, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Sanford Meisner acting technique class, um, the scholarships that are available, and especially the quote um, from a recipient that really helps um, frame it. Um, 
Let's see, they're making some really strategic choices about artistic content um, and also to minimize their expenses. So they're doing some smart work there. Um, I like the focus on the um, diverse artists and new plays. They have very specific goals that are laid out in that. Um, stories by and about people of marginalized backgrounds. Um, it was really interesting that they're also including on their site an art gallery um, where artists receive 100% proceeds of the work sold. Um, and I appreciate that they're investing in um, career development um, with the program to fund two artistic positions for a two-year contract that includes salary and benefits. I thought that was a really smart um, structure, a really intentional way to do that. Um, the budget explanations that were provided were very clear and very useful to understand um, the budget. The board and staff, uh, the reported demographics are consistent with the mission that they've stated. Um, it looks like they've put some really strong policies uh, toward board diversity beginning in 2019. So I just want to recognize that a lot of organizations have begun to put policies in place in the last few years, but the fact that they were starting it as early as 2019 is, is to be noted. Um, and I'll wrap up with one last note. Um, they made a note in the application about uh, lower attendance and um, the impact on the income, um, but the fact that they're also laying out strategies to, to cut expenses and to kind of balance it out um, and address financial stability is, is um, commendable. That's it. Thank you. Ebony, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, Sarah covered a lot of it, which is great. Um, I'm just going to reiterate, I think, uh, artistically speaking, I think uh, Phoenix Theater really elevating uh, issues and producing a lot of new work um, kind of, uh, again, uh, further diversifies that kind of American theater canon. So I think it's really great um, that that's a priority for the organization um, that's like reflective and of diverse perspectives, um, which, which then in turn also um, engages, I would imagine, a, a, a diverse um, a diverse audience, but also uplifts new playwrights, um, which is a really great um, thing to see. Uh, so that was one thing I, I really wanted to commend them on. Um, I, I really appreciated that the organization um, uh, ensures that there are providing space for conversations um, that are impacting uh, the the community and so that so being able to kind of provide space for for that dialogue is I think uh really great um and serve as a resource for other arts organizations um and and then yeah just to reiterate the um it seems like they're being really uh smart with their uh operating expenses and and making sure that they're cutting back on productions um just to conserve um what they are able to do and and, and sustainably I think is really really commendable so yeah. Great, right, thank you. Any additional comments? Okay, if there's no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. All right, our next application is a request from Indianapolis Ballet. Indianapolis Ballet embraces the history and future of classical ballet through dynamic performances, visionary new works, extraordinary training, and by providing transformative community outreach programs to the widest possible audiences. Indianapolis Ballet and the Indianapolis School of Ballet believe in a culturally diverse environment and the physical, intellectual, emotional, and artistic growth of all dancers. They were founded in 2006. They had a 2022 operating income of 1,974,655. They have 11 board members, 32 full-time employees. The audience served in 2022 is 18,349. And with that, I will ask Cheney to read out Rochelle's comments. Thanks, Nikki. Rochelle begins by saying the ballet season is reflected of many successful ballets with few unexpected performances. And some of these, for example, were the Indie Fringe, Pre the Indie Fringe Festival and the New Works. Um, she said those were highlights of some of their um, upcoming season. They are correct that they are pushing the boundaries of traditional understandings of ballet, but that the company is to be commended for future new works by diverse choreographers representing the minority groups in dance. And she noted especially William Robinson and Ramon Flowers. Another sign of success is strong ticket sales, 
but the application is lacking in details and in numbers. So for instance, how many children are served by its Indian Ballet Classrooms program? This brings in weekly one-hour ballet instruction to elementary students in Indianapolis Public Schools and Crystal House Academies. And these places are located in Hallville, Garford Park, UNWA, and Tocito Park neighborhoods. Um, she noted that the Indianapolis Ballet Classroom seems like a wonderful program, but would have liked to know more about the success and its sustainability within these classes that are free. She closes by saying that the ballet proclaims that it is the preeminent site for professional dance instruction in central Indiana, and that graduates are accepted into top institutions like the School of American Ballet, Dance Theater of Harlem, and Houston Ballet. But something that she would have wanted to know more and that she questioned was who are these students that are representative of these programs? She'd love to learn more about some of these future stars individually. Thank you. Sarah, anything you'd like to add? Sure, thank you. I'll add a few um, notes to that. Um, um, I think it's great to see that the organization is um, growth oriented. They're um, investing in the number and the quality um, of the dancers. And I um, understand from um, the application that they're focused on the um, diversifying the dancers as well. So um, that is good to see. Um, I like that they uh, highlighted in a few instances um, staff that are uh, former students um, in the ballet school. So that is also um, growth oriented and exciting to see. Um, I wanted to just recognize one quote that I appreciated um, that the organization wants to challenge the perception of ballet as a Eurocentric endeavor. I thought that was exciting. Um, yeah, and also also uh, investing in staff raises. I thought that was really good to see. Um, focusing on fully staffing their development team. Um, it looks like they've had a lot of changes in staff, but um, moving in a positive direction at this point. Um, and also um, celebrate that the organization has a new endowment as of 2022. That's um, that's great to see and looks like um, going in a great direction with um, robust ticket sales, um, a lot of growth in that area as well, and um, commend that the organization reported um, demographics, not just race-based demographics, but also um, reporting LGBTQ for their board. Um, so just recognizing that as well. Great, thank you. Any other panel comments? I'll just... Um talk about the strategic plan seems to be in line with their mission, um, but it is pretty focused on business development. And when they're talking so much about diversity and diversifying um, the organization in general, uh, they include a diversity statement, but it would be great to see the strategies included to help you um, make that a reality. And also with the robust ticket sales, both of you um, picked up on that, perhaps it's time to allocate some of that money to make the diversity statement become a reality. Thank you. Any other comments? Great, if there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. Okay, the next application is a request from Kepra Institute. The Kepra Institute is a community organization that works to create a more just, equitable, human-centered world by nurturing youth and young adults to be leaders, critical thinkers, and doers who see the people in any community as the most valuable assets and are committed to working to use culture to bring about change that leads to empowered, sustainable communities. They were founded in 2004. They had a 2022 operating income of 2200000 10,389. They have nine board members, seven full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 was 5,000. With that, I will ask Ebony to begin the discussion. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of Kepra Institute, um, it is very clear that there is a deep uh, sense of community building uh, within the programming that um, they offer. Um, I really appreciated the narrative of the Cafe Creative. Um, I, I think it has both uh, kind of a local uh, reach, but then also uh, can nationally help provide access um, for local artists to 
connect with uh, artists uh, across the country, um, which I think is, and learn from them. And I think that that's a really beautiful um, thing for, especially for young, younger artists. Um, I really uh, loved hearing about the vocab program um, and then its impact on uh, their BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus poets um, in poetry. Um, I thought the Unlearn Arts program was really amazing, um, you know, promoting kind of a narrative shift in the way we, again, view that American theater ca canon um, and, and requiring kind of a representation for underrepresented non non-dominant demographics in the arts and cultural world. Um, and so just being able to kind of uh, start from a place of of creating a program like that, I think is very um, impactful for for artists um, who who may not see themselves in in the kind of more traditional American uh, theater canon. Um, and I also just appreciate the awareness and the recognition of TV and media um, art forms is having such a huge present. Um, right now in, in our kind of creative economy. And so uh, providing kind of workshops that uh, allow young artists to really dive into screenwriting um, is, is always also great to see. Um, I think uh, there's a very clear purpose uh, with engaging in BIPOC and LGBTQIA youth within the community uh, for the organization. Um, and I appreciated seeing also the partnerships that uh, the organization has been working on uh, and developing the stated pur uh, purpose of, quote, um, building cultural understanding through lens of Afrofuturism. Um, I think that's a very purposeful goal. And I think uh, being very intentional with partnerships that kind of help further that mission is very, um, it's a very uh, uh, dedicated uh, decision. And I think that that's really great that they're um, working on um, that direction. Um, I was a little confused about the projected income uh, for the year being less than the projected annual expense for the year. Um, there wasn't a comment on it. And so there was kind of that uh, roughly like $106,000 deficit. And so I just wasn't sure if like, that was approved or what, what the, the narrative was behind that. Um, and I also really appreciated to see that the organization is governing horizontally. Um, I think that that kind of, it, I think the horizontal, uh, governing structure, as well as a commitment to kind of that intergenerational staff is uh, really, really cool. And I I, I love that uh, seeing a structure like that was, um, or being able to read about a structure like that was really interesting. Um, and, and just seeing that the, the practice of the non-hierarchical non um, uh, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, basically, uh, <laughs> I forget what, what the term is, but uh, yeah, just just kind of that sense of non hierarchy non hierarchy in terms of decision making for the organization is I, I think is um, really great to to see. Um, I also think it's great that they're trying to um, become completely self sustaining within the next ten years, um, and that they're uh, creating uh, an arm of um, uh, earned income through uh, potential DEI consulting trainings uh, for the organ that the organization would. Um, uh, provide to other organizations. That was that was really great to see as well. Great, thank you. Any additional comments? Great. If there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. All right. The next application is a request from Gang Gang. Gang Gang's mission is to support people of color in the creative economy to produce more culture, beauty, and equity across cities. They were founded in 2020. They had a 2022 operating income of 3,180,390. They have 19 board members, five full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 was 10,000. With that, I will ask Ray to begin the discussion. Okay. So just first of all, um, the organization is in process of becoming a nonprofit and has been under the fiscal sponsorship of the Community Foundation. Um, as I was reading this, I kind of was at needing a better description of the organization in general, um, a little more concrete as opposed to aspirational. Um, it focuses on three areas, creative direction, transformative production, and um, cultural leadership. And uh, just describing those and giving examples of what that means uh, 
in addition to the couple that they've given would be much, much more helpful. Um, same thing about the, or, uh, about the budget. They um, seem to be strong uh, with a positive um, income as opposed to expensive expenses. Um, they do make a lot of claims about uh, their thoughtful in their assessment program, but they didn't demonstrate any results. For example, you know, how much did you do? How well did you do it? Is anyone better off from your programs? Um, their signature program, it, it seems to be butter and art fair with 100% of the profits going to artists, which is amazing, and also got a lot of uh, notice and press. So their goal um, with people is to serve 350 creatives, but I'm not really sure what that means, what the timeline is, and what the dollar amount towards that meant. I will say that they um, are working on access. Overall, they're working with people of color to present events in accessible spaces. They have grassroots leadership um, that allows them to get to know people and help them do their work um, at the underground running. I love their education programs that are in line with their building the individual um, creative economy for people of color um, as they're creating a pipeline with teams, teens and paying for artists and creatives. Again, they claim to bring notoriety to Indianapolis, um, but I didn't see much offering of examples of media other than the New York Times article about uh, butter. So I would just recommend that overall, um, they seem to be growing, but I'd like to see more information on their strategic plan um, goals, how they uh, target their three areas of business um, and sort of what the results are even if they, again, are anecdotes for success as opposed to um, hard numbers that they might have at this point. But it seems like a great organization that is very, very well financially supported by the community. That would be it. Great, thank you. Um, Cheney, can you read out Rochelle's comments? Um, yes. Um, she mentioned that gang gang are ambitious and inspiring. The organization shows how it works with partners, piloting with the mix with the chamber and connecting with the Black Chamber and Black Onyx Management for diversity outreach. Um, she also shares some similar observations to Ray about the application um, lacks the kind of detail to give a sense of whether these efforts are working and some details, excuse me, and some details raised even more so questions. So for example, marketing and operations budget represented a monumental increase without clarity on why the leap was so great. And then Rochelle closes with saying, they partner with Marathon Health to launch a public art project in its health centers in six cities to help increase access to work with people from marginalized communities. The goal is for 75% of this project, excuse me, 75% of this project um, funding will go towards people of color but what is gonna be the outcome of this program? So for a program that seems so initiative, it should be better tell the story and how its outreach is reflective of the amazing community impact. Thank you. Any additional panel comments? Great, no further comments. Please update your scores in the system if needed. Um, okay, after this next review is complete, the panel will take a 15 minute break followed by Indiana Black Expo. The next application is a request from the Indianapolis Art Center. Stemming from a belief that accessible arts programs and cultural spaces are fundamentally important to a healthy community, the Indianapolis Art Center's mission is to inspire creative expression in all people. They were founded in 1934. They had a 2022 operating income of 3,857,016. They have 24 board members, 21 full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 is 200,000. And with that, I will ask Sarah to begin the discussion. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so the Indianapolis Arts Center, um, is clear in their application about their belief in art to transform and as a, as a therapeutic uh, resource. 
Um, they give a really clear description and a broad range of programs. Um, some numbers, 1,500 classes, 6,500 students, um, and doing a lot of outreach to underserved uh, communities, incarcerated communities, seniors, military, et cetera. Um, it's exciting that they also have um, open uh, space grounds with um, art, art installations included. Um, they have really clear goals and evaluation for the programs, um, highlighting that they've recently expanded um, to a new location that is located alongside Black-owned businesses. So that sounds like a great um, uh, growth plan for the organization. Um, they talk a lot about a scholarship program. I, I was wishing for a little bit more detail on that, about how that works. Um, but um, recognizing that they have uh, no admission fees for um, most of their exhibits and access to the grounds. They focused on 11 active sites, so that's pretty impressive, um, plus 20 through the Arts Reach program. Um, let's see, they also are involved in um, pretty significant art fairs, which sound exciting. Uh, where enrollment is growing. Um, an area for growth um, that the organization discussed in the application is the um, growing the diversity and um, demographics um, for their uh, participants and, and audiences that are participating in the programs. Um, some, of, um, some of those areas were not um, reported in the application, but discussed in the narrative. So a little bit of confusion there. Um, they did report demographics for the art reach program, and that seems very in line with the priorities uh, stated in, in the narratives. Um, they talked about 75 teaching artists, which is really exciting, um, um, being a top employer for artists um, in Indiana. Um, I also appreciated how they uh, specified that they allowed their faculty, their teaching artists to use studio spaces and sell their own work. Uh, through various events and their online marketplace. I thought that was great. Um, let's see. Um, so they taught, um, it looks like the reported uh, demographics for artists that are paid through the organization is, is not yet reaching their goals, um, their DEI goals, but they also talked about staffing shortages. So, um, um, looks like there's there's opportunity for growth in their um, teaching artists. Um, the organization does not currently have a balanced budget, but is working to um, address that. They talked about um, that the financials have improved in recent years, but there wasn't a lot of um, notes to explain that. So I wish I could have understood that a little bit better. And um, I do appreciate, and I'm wrapping it up, I do appreciate that they are investing in staff training um, and uh, recognize their strategic plan and 20 year master facility plan. Um, some good work going in there. Um, and I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Um, Ebony, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, just quickly, um, I um, just wanted to highlight a couple of couple of things about the application. Um, uh, I would have loved to uh, hear more about the work um, that the organization is doing with insider art, um, specifically with regards to um, the youth that are incarcerated. Um, I just wanted to know more about how um, the dynamic of, of bringing awareness of, of uh, youth that are incarcerated, uh, working on their work within the uh, um, program is then maybe in, in a way being brought to the community of people who aren't, you know, I'm just, I wasn't sure like what the, the narrative was, but beyond uh, just working uh, with youth who are in, incarcerated, um, I was I was curious about if that work was being uplifted and, and elevated to community members who are not incarcerated and, and bringing awareness to the space. That was just something I was curious about. Um, uh, another part of uh, the Hillside Art Center, as Sarah mentioned, I think that's a really um, exciting uh, new opportunity. And, and again, it was something that I was just kind of curious about of understanding what the dynamics were because this space is going to be um, near a lot of predominantly black owned businesses. Like 
what some of the, I, it just would have been nice to hear some reflections about like, if, if there's been any conversations about the, the organizations that already exist in that space and what has been the dialogue um, with, with them uh, and Hillsides or and Hillside, but um, more largely uh, Indianapolis Art Center. Um, and just that would have been kind of interesting. Um, and then also just another thing, um, and I know that the organization is really working uh, on DEI work all throughout, and I know that they're looking to hire an HR person. And, and so um, my assumption uh, uh, for the organization is that it's just that once the HR person in place that the work of DEI does not just fall to them, um, you know, it's an ongoing and active practice. And it seems like that is very much apparent uh, for the organization. So just understanding that, that that's something um, where every stakeholder group is responsible and accountable for, for their contrib contribution uh, toward the DEI goals. And it wouldn't just be when the HR person comes in that that would be um, the work of the HR person. Great, thank you. Any other panel comments? Great, if there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. Okay, now it's time for a 15 minute break. So please be back at 2.17 to begin the review of Indiana Black Expo.
Everyone will give a second while our panelists make their way back. All right, welcome back from our 15 minute break. We will jump right back into the public review. As a reminder, the panel scores are all applications in three main areas, artistic merit, organizational capacity, community impact, and all three criteria center racial and socioeconomic equity. The next, the next application is a request from Indiana Black Expo. Indiana Black Expo is an effective voice and vehicle for the social and economic advancement of African-American youth and families. They had a 2022 operating income of 4,543,853. They have 21 board members, five full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 was 400,000. And with that, I will ask Sarah to begin the discussion. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so this application, um, it makes it really clear that the organization has a significant impact on the community. Um, um, that is primarily through two annual events um, as described in the application, the Summer Celebration and the Circle City Classic, which both present a wide variety of um, arts and culture um, components to the programs. Um, especially the Cultural Arts Pavilion. Um, let's see, lots of other partners involved, which is really um, interesting to see. Um, one piece that I wanted to know a little bit more about was um, how the other organizations and the programs that are affiliated with the Cultural Arts Pavilion, sort of how are they woven together? Um, are they all working to plan it as a group? Um, how that works. Um, the application um, is very clear and it's uh, the objectives um, for the outcomes um, that is stated very clearly. Um, it talks about surveys uh, completed by um, the uh, attendees, which is really great. Um, I was curious uh, about the surveys. Um, Again, are those developed with the partner organizations or are they um, developed specifically by the applicant? Um, um, it talks about the event happening at the convention center. I was curious about what that partnership was like. Um, let's see. Um, it talks about, the application talks about um, a committee uh, that works uh, to develop the artist programs and executes the programs at the pavilion. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about that committee, who's represented on the committee, how, how are they working together, um, what's their role, and um, are the members of that committee paid in any way through the event? Um, the application indicates that there are no artists paid through the program, so um, I, I wanted to know a little bit more in the narratives, like how are they paid, are they paid through partners, et cetera. Um, let's see. Um, I had some questions about the expenses budget. It seems like maybe there were some pieces missing that I wanted to know a little bit more about. Um, I know that in the application that were attached budgets that, um, that plugged in some of that information, um, but the part in the application was a little bit unclear. Um, uh, recognizing that the board for the organization and the staff um, seems really strong um, um, for the organizational capacity, um, it's clear that the reported demographics for the board and the staff are very much in line with the mission. Um, I did have to question a little bit, though. Um, it's um, a primarily male board, but a female staff. So I was curious about how that works. What's the dynamic there? Um, and then some of the reported, num um, reported numbers in there, I couldn't tell if they were numbers or percentages. So I had a couple of questions there. Um, but overall, the, the events um, that are being put on look really um, um, big and um, impactful, and it's it's clear that they're very significant in the community. And that's it for me. Thank you. 
Any additional panel comments? If there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. As previously announced, all scores will be kept confidential. The next application is a request from the Indianapolis Cultural Trail. Their mission is to inspire, create, and sustain connections and cultural experiences that are accessible to all. They were founded in 2007. They had a 2022 operating income of 5446000 we have 16 board members, seven full-time employees. The audience served in 2022 was 1 million. With that, I will ask Cheney to read out Rochelle's comments. Thanks, Mickey. Rochelle begins with saying the cultural trail is clearly an art star for Indianapolis. It's providing an experience for nearly 1 million people. The trail is be commended for launching an open call this year for partners to increase diverse program offerings. And in reference to its audience numbers, um, she mentions that if it uses spotters to determine that a million people use a trail annually, then why can't this method, method be used the same to provide the general estimates for their diverse audience? And then Rochelle closes with saying, the trail is to be commended for innovative programming and building a national reputation that it is well-deserved. And as few other cases in this annual grants program review, it is a project that should be emulated in other cities. Great, thank you. Uh, Ray, anything you'd like to add? Yes, I love this. And just like she said, emulated in other cities in Cincinnati, we are actually looking at this. And I'm, I pass this on as a model for us to look at. So the trail is definitely putting Indy, in Indy on the map. Um, I love that they're engaging local artists, not only just in the art, but also in the planning of the extension. Um, so to have the, the, design, the artists as designers at the table is so smart. That's good. Great, thank you. Any additional comments? Great, if there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. The next application is a request from the Idol Drug Museum of American Indians and Western Art. Their mission is to inspire an appreciation and understanding of the art, history, and cultures of the American West and the indigenous peoples of North America. The Edeldorf Museum collects and preserves Western art and Native American art and cultural ob objects of the highest quality and serves the public, public through engaging ex exhibitions, educational programs, cultural exchanges, and entertaining special events. They are founded in 1985, they had a 2022 operating income of 6,970,702. They have 34 board members, 44 full-time employees. The audience served in 2022 was 90,896. With that, I will ask Ebony to begin the discussion. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so yeah, um, I think upon reading about the Idle Jorg uh, Museum, it's it's evident that they are providing a plethora of programming to really um, kind of help audiences better understand the historical and cultural context of, of the art that's um, displayed within their, their building. Um, I think it's really key that the staff of the museum is really looking to develop and foster relationships with members of Native nations, um, as well as experts from indig Indigenous cultural centers. Um, uh, I think being able to have uh, being able to partner with those groups, um, not only with receiving feedback, but also providing agency and how um, those groups are, are kind of playing a factor in um, the exhibitions and the program, the artistic programming that the museum offers. So that was really um, lovely to read about. Um, I appreciated reading a, a, a lot about the different methods of access that the organization offers um, in taking place to provide a kind of a more diverse representation of demographic voices uh, within the space. Um, I would have appreciated hearing a bit more about what the organization is looking to do to reestablish their uh, networking group for, for younger folks and, 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 the, and younger folks' relationships to the museum. Um, but it was great to see the various like federal and museum led holidays and, and the different monetary subsidizing programs that um, the Idle Drug offers. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I, I also really appreciated kind of 
going back to uh, my comment about uh, the partnerships with Native nations and, and different um, Indigenous cultural groups, I really appreciated seeing that the organization has a Native American Advisory Council, um, which is in addition to the DEAI Council, um, which I think is really important um, that they're very intentionally separate um, and, and both groups are er, and not conflated. Um, I think, uh, let's see. I wish that they had elaborated a bit more on how they've made targeted changings to recruiting, training, and retaining employee diversity with regards to staff. Um, I, I saw that they were look, looking to do it within their strategic plan, but it was a bit broad. Like, for example, it was like enhanced recruitment, um, but I didn't really understand what enhance meant. Um, so, you know, uh, that was just something about kind of just like the specificity of, of what they're really looking to do with regards to diversifying their staff and how what efforts they're looking to do in order to achieve those goals would have been uh, very helpful. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I thought it was great to read about how the organization is looking to utilize um, um, monet, uh, monet, a minority of, um, and woman-owned business to assist in the search of uh, the replacement of their CEO. Um, so that was uh, great to read. Um, I think, uh, if there wasn't enough formalized data for the organization to gather complete numbers on each demographic group, um, it's, it's from the demographic, uh, outline of the application, it's clear that there's still a much larger white, um, audience uh, than other demographic groups. So I would have just been interested in hearing kind of uh, the organization's reflections or observations as there's still um, kind of less than half of all combined racial demographics um, who are served within the county um, with regards to, um, especially kind of in contrast to how, again, they offer a lot of accessibility efforts uh, to kind of create more culturally diverse pathways into the museum. So that would have been helpful to hear a little bit more about. Thank you. Any additional comments from you, Sarah? Um, thanks, Nikki. I'll add a few more. Um, thanks, Ebony, you covered that so well. Um, so I don't have a lot to add. I'll just, um, I, I wanted to recognize the web, uh, website resources that are being added uh, through the, the museum. I thought that was really um, great to provide broader access um, to the story than the collections. Um, and Ebony, you already mentioned this, but I'll just echo it, the um, significance of working with tribal advisors to tell their own stories. I really appreciate that. And also um, uh, liked seeing information about the contemporary content being emphasized um, in the programs alongside more historical focus, um, and that they're adding art markets, fellowships, artists in residence alongside um, the focus on the museum's collection. Um, and um, the final note that I wanted to mention was um, recognizing the focus on a three-part uh, revenue sharing between contributed, earned, and endowment. I thought that was a smart approach. And that's it for me. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Go ahead, Ray. You look yeah, like you're I, about to say. <laughs> I was I was just gonna add that um, using a third of uh, their budget covered by the uh, endowment every year, I would just wonder how sustainable that is and um, how that works out over the long term. I wish I would have seen a description or some details about that. Thank you. Any other comments? Great. There are no further comments. Please update your scores in the system if needed. Our next application is a request from the Indiana Repertory Theater. Rooted in the heart of Indiana, uh, Indiana Repertory Theater is committed to building a vital, vibrant, and informed community through the transformational power of live theater. The Indiana Repertory Theater produces inclusive, top quality, professional theater and community programming to engage, surprise, challenge, and entertain members of the whole community. They were founded in 1971. They have a 2022 operating income of 7,041,582. They have 35 board members, 54 full-time employees, and an audience served in 2022 was 44,224. With that, I will ask Ray to begin the discussion. 
Great, thank you. So Indiana Rep Theater is uh, known throughout the country as one of the equity theaters. Uh, it's the largest nonprofit theater in the state with 100,000 live experiences pre-COVID. Um, and like most theaters at this point, the audiences aren't returning as quick quickly. Um, and they've made the decision to reduce one play next season to account for that, which I think is in line with what people are doing and is smart. Their um, artistic director is retiring in July, so they have a succession plan. They've chosen the associate artistic director. They don't talk about what that process was, but um, it seems to be a smart move as, as we're transitioning out of a pandemic, maybe. Um, they say that their stories that they put on stage are, are stories of the people, and um, they needed just to continue to diversify those stories. They do have some very um, specific uh, metrics in place um, to cast as many BIPOC actors as possible, and um, a total pool of directors and designers represented with 50% BIPOC artists, which is very measurable. Um, and they provide low-cost tickets and consider all ADA and listening devices for access. 40% um, of their programming is dedicated to student audiences. Um, and I'll just say that they do recognize that they're a predominantly white institution producing culturally specific stories with and by artists of color, and they still have work to do to be seen as a place in the community where the community gathers. Um, it also needs to be reflected in the board and staff which seems to still be underrepresented by people of color. Thanks. Thank you. Benny, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, so I definitely uh, appreciated seeing uh, Indiana Repertory Theater's uh, intentionality about hiring, uh, being uh, really um, cautious, or not cautious, being really intentional, I guess, about hiring um, from, casting to design, really making sure that the um, uh, that there is a diversity in, in the entirety of the art, creative artistic process. Um, so that that was really great to see. Um, I was kind of curious uh, to know more about the inclusion programming um, and more specifically about how that programming attempts did to uh, work not only to elevate the voices of BIPOC artists, but also attract and retain more diverse audiences who could um, resonate um, with the work that's being presented on stage. Um, I saw their example of like uh, Frida self-portrait um, and it, I think that that's a really uh, great and intentional choice of, of trying to develop a show that um, would help attract uh, Latin audiences to the production. So the implication isn't that just the show is being performed for predominantly white audiences, even though it's a show um, that is kind of uh, talking about maybe a more uh, Latin uh, experience, cultural experience. Um, so that was, you know, that was great to see. Um, I was uh, a little curious about um, that the uh, organization, it was great to see that the organization invest, invested in a director of inclusion and community partnerships. Um, and, but I didn't recall seeing anything about the uh, kind of the ambassadors program, which I believe they are overseeing, um, is if that's like a paid positions, like if the ambassadors are being paid, um, because it just, it, the way that it was reading is the work that the ambassadors would be doing is ultimately helping the organization become more inclusive and equitable in their efforts. So I was just wondering if that was something that these people were being compensated for. Um, and uh, I think I was a little bit confused uh, one thing about the application that confused me a bit was that um, the decision to include community conversation participants, uh, part of their programming as audience members and not keep them under participants. And so, especially to the point that they made that not all participants are also audiences. So I guess I was just a little bit confused as to why they didn't just count them under participants and not audiences. I, I don't know, maybe it was like hard to, cause there might've been a lot of overlap, but that was a little bit confusing um, on my end as a, as a reader. Um, but I thought their strategic plan uh, 
was really great in looking at all aspects of the audition, the rehearsal, and the performance process um, and making sure that it is equitable and fair for all the actors within the organization. Great, thank you. Any other panel comments? Okay. There's no further comments. Please update your scores in the system if needed. Okay, the next application is a request for Music for All. Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. They were founded in 1971. They had a 2022 operating income of 8,867,919. They have 24 board members, 28 full-time employees, and their audience served in 2022 was 130,000. And with that, I will ask Sarah to begin the discussion. Sorry, I was having a little technical glitch. Uh, we are on music for all, thank you. Give me one second, I apologize. Almost there. Okay, so um, Music for All application had a really great, um, strong list of partners. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about the um, outcome of some of those partnerships. Um, the programs in the public schools um, are being presented at uh, no cost to students and educators, which is really great to see. Um, I was curious where the program fees are coming from that are um, represented in the application. Um, so lots of interesting programs are introduced in the application. Um, I was a little bit unclear on what some of them do and how they're working. So I wanted a little bit more uh, detail on those. Um, the narrative states uh, that there's a focus on historically underrepresented communities, um, but there are no demographics reported. So um, that was a little bit that was a little bit confusing for me in reading the application. Um, the artistic programs are, are really clearly described. Um, um, let's see. I, I wanted to know a little bit more about um, how this leadership, um, the design that comes from the board, um, um, the board reported demographics are, are not um, very diverse and are majority male um, in the application. So I was curious how that leadership is advancing um, racial equity through the artistic programs as is stated in the um, application. I just needed some more information about that. Um, let's see, they're hiring musicians and educators to carry out the curriculum. Um, some of those are local. Um, there was also um, not a very diverse demographic reported for that group. Um, so I wanted to know just, you know, I, I wanted a little bit more description of what the efforts are to um, increase diversity amongst their teaching artists and their um, board. Um, um, let's see, and so they talked a lot about the competitions and the summer camp, um, but I wanted to know a little bit more on the educational programs, like how they're working, what's the structure, what's the outcomes uh, there. And um, so the organization has a, a, a significant budget um, based primarily um, on program revenue. Um, there's not a lot of um, grant funding represented in the application um, and some, some shifts in the budget um, that didn't have any um, notes. So I wanted to know a little bit more about that. I wanted to know a little bit more about where the program revenue is coming from. Um, if it's, it's amazing that they're making the programs to the public schools free, uh, but I wanted to know a little bit more about how they were supported. And I'll, I'll end there. Great, thank you. Ray, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, that was very thorough. I'll just uh, reiterate that some more details about programming and um, specifics about programming would be uh, really helpful. Um, 
uh, there are claims about what Music for All does for music education, but there is nothing really to back it up. So those sorts of claims um, need to have some meat behind them. And uh, just overall, uh, it could be just part of the grant um, writing portion, or I uh, just wonder if there are goals and outcomes set. That leadership um, that Sarah was talking about, there's also a a group of 12 music education professional professionals that advise the, um, the organization. And it would be interesting to see what that actually means. Is it, is it the advisory council or committee? Are they designing assessment and measuring? Um, what are they doing as the professionals? And overall, their board um, has a strategy to diversify, ensure succession planning, and maintain active governance and board diversity. That's good, thanks. Thank you. Any other panel comments? Great, if there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. Our next application is a request from Indiana State Museum Foundation. The mission of the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites is to serve as a catalyst for informal lifelong learning that connects the stories of real people, places, and things. They were founded in 1968, made a 2022 operating income of 11 million one hundred seventy thousand eight hundred or 858. They have 18 board members, 94 full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 was 199,127. And with that, I will ask Sarah to begin the discussion. Thank you. Um, okay, Indiana, Indiana State Museum Foundation. Um, um, let's see. We had a lot of great information in the application about um, Indiana students and educators receiving free admission. That's really great. Um, I was excited to see some of the partnerships that they're um, expanding into, especially Asante Art Institute is in residence and the museum. I thought that was really smart um, to bring in partners to strengthen engagement efforts um, with diverse audiences, you know, to partner with um, organizations that are the experts in the work um, to have a mutually beneficial partnership. Um, it looks like attendance and membership is growing, so that's really exciting. Um, I was curious in some of the reported numbers, the participant and audience numbers, how those are impacted by the school programs, like which ones were um, direct services to school programs and which ones were um, um, individuals coming into the museum. I was, that was a little bit confusing for me um, to read. Um, the narrative, some, some another little confusion point that I had in reading was the narrative would kind of go back and forth between um, whether the applicant was representing the system of 12 locations, um, as well as the State Museum, um, was the application more focused on the State Museum, so that's just something to um, especially for readers who are less familiar with the, the museum itself to remember to clarify, are we talking about the museum or the 12 location um, system, um, especially when we're talking about neighborhoods surrounding, um, you know, are we surrounding all the different locations or just the museum when we're talking about that. Um, I did appreciate the focus on universal design in the application. Um, uh, the application talked a lot about a transition from a collections-centered approach to a visitor-centered approach. I thought that was um, interesting to read about. Um, a lot of positive programming focused on Indiana artists, Native cultures, um, and, the, and the Black community. Would like to know a little bit more about um, how is that being invested in, like what percentages of the exhibition budget um, goes to each of those focus areas. Um, uh, I liked how the staff was organized in teams. Um, I, I, I assume that allows for some accountability across the museum's staff. Um, that, was, that was great to read about. Um, they're receiving some support and recognition from significant national agencies. That's great. Um, 
the uh, application emphasizes their GEI work, um, especially with the board, um, but then also reported just one new member as an outcome of that. So it would have been good to understand the timeline um, when the work started, you know, um, what what is the timeline to um, add more than one new board member. Um, and let's see. Yeah, when when did that um, also with the staff, when did the refined recruitment and hiring begin um, in a in a again confusion with the museum and the 12 locations, but in a staff of 156 people I'm, I'm wondering is there regular turnover is there um, opportunity there to you know what are the opportunities to further diversify the staff. Um, and just um, noting the financial stability of the organization with 75% of the income coming from state government. And that's it. Thank you. Um, Cheney, can you read out Rochelle's comments? Uh, yes, I can. Rochelle begins by echoing some of your sentiments, Sarah, about their goals. Um, she mentions that the museum not only has met its goals, but it's also managing the creation of new goals as well. They are reaching out to new partners continually is always smart and the long running Hoosier Salon is genius and a perfect way to establish emerging artists and supporting veteran artists. Rochelle then closes with saying the 2022 edition had 129 contributing artists and the ISMHS purchased several works for its permanent collection and she hopes it continues. Thank you. Any other panel comments? Great. If there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. Our next application is a request from Drum Corps International. The mission of Drum Corps International is to bring the life enriching benefits and enjoyment of marching music, performing arts to more people worldwide. To do this by creating a, a stage for participating organizations to engage in education, competition, entertainment, and the promotion of individual growth. They were founded in 1972. They had a 2022 operating income of 15,106,612. They have nine board members, 25 full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 was 350,649. And with that, I will ask Cheney to read out Rochelle's comments. Okay. Thanks, Nikki. Um, Michelle begins by saying, what a unique addition to the artistic offerings that Indianapolis can claim. Um, it's hard to determine the impact this national organization has on this city or country without some demographic data. This organization's mission is unique and should be welcoming in any city, particularly that ones that provide entertainment um, not otherwise offered. And excuse me, it must do some major adjusting to the accounting for the budget drop due to the loss of the pandemic support, which income seems to have ensured a balanced budget. And um, while they do describe there's a vast reach of 7.2 million young people between the ages of 13 and 22 involved in the performing arts across the United States. Um, she also was one of, unaware if this was the annual reach for their program and that demographic information would have been helpful. Its popularity and connection to communities is clear by having 8,000 students participate in the audition for the open positions in the competitive touring corps each year. Hosting 100 events nationally to find a world champion is no small feat. And she said she would have loved to been able to see a video to show the excitement that this invokes for their performances. The organization has some work to do on the diversity and the participants and leadership, particularly one that involves um, providing entertainment not otherwise offered by the minority participants nationwide. Um, outreach for diversity could be for the drum corps as well. They could do recruitment for middle school bands and college bands featuring drum corps and particularly HBCUs. And she also mentioned that it might be worth an effort to find participating potential board members in those spaces. This could be a great way to expand the size, the breadth, and diversity of its audience. Their board um, may also want to consult with similar organizations to get some guidance on this. And then she closes with saying, it would be nice if there were more participants from Indiana, if Indiana is truly the home for the corpse. But nonetheless, she hopes that out of the 4,500 4, fans that hopefully she will return post pandemic and she could be one of those people that attend the competitions. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Ray, anything you'd like to add? She covered a lot, but and I agree with a lot of what she said. You know, after 50 years, um, you, 
we could use some evidence about the claims that they make um, and just some more definitions about their programming, like how band or the process, how bands are selected and in order to be elite, what does that really mean? Um, and how the organization, how is the organization open to all comers? So um, just reiterating uh, the impact that it had, the organization has on Indiana and if there are any economic studies or reports that they could share as well. Thanks. Great, thank you. Any additional panel comments? Great, if there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. Our next application is a request from Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. The mission of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra is to inspire, entertain, educate, and challenge through innovative programs and symphonic music performed at the highest artistic level. They were founded in 1941 in a 2022 operating income of 23,553,186. They have 36 board members, 52 full-time employees, and the audience served in 2022 with 7,652. And with that, I will ask Ebony to begin the discussion. Thank you. Um, so uh, upon reading uh, ISO's organ um, application, uh, I thought it was really great to see all of the various types of programming uh, that they offer um, to engage various types of audiences. Um, I would have been interested to see how the organization plans to uh, for more formalize how they track the audiences, um, as it seems really pertinent to understanding like what action steps they need to take um, in order to draw and retain the diverse audiences that they're seeking to attract. Um, I think it's great that they're partnering with uh, Sphinx, um, you know, as their work is very much rooted in creating and uplifting opportunities for uh, music, classical musicians of color. So it's really great to see that they have a partnership with one of uh, with an organization like that. Um, uh, I appreciated uh, seeing the initiatives that they're taking on to ensure um, that the work is going beyond the physical location uh, of the organization, um, you know, working with grassroots venues and community based organizations. Um, it was also really nice to see them taking steps to create more access to classical performances, offering free programming, um, really lessening the barrier of attending um, oftentimes uh, rather expensive uh, performances. Um, I think it was really lovely to read about all the educational opportunities that the organization offers. Um, I was curious to know more about uh, the side-by-side -side program. Um, I think that initiative along with MYO uh, felt like uh, two very great opportunities to provide younger musicians with the tools to really work toward um, engaging a, a professional career in, in uh, the classical arts, uh, classical musical arts. Um, and I was just wondering if uh, specifically with the side by side program, if they were offering students with financial compensation um, as the they are essentially going through the professional process of auditioning and, and performing for the for the organization. So I was just kind of curious about um, that. Um, it, it's very evident that um, ISO is in stable financial standing um, and it looks like they're taking appropriate measures to really secure uh, their financial standing long-term. Um, I really appreciated the transparency and understanding the makeup of uh, the organizational, um, the, sorry, the organizational makeup, both administratively as well as artistically um, and how it, it is not yet uh, as representative of the greater communities that reside um, in Indianapolis. Um, I will say that upon looking at the strategic plan, uh, again, language like um, accomplish successful and meaningful projects with measurable results that demonstrate their commitment to DEIB is, is, is again, it's a little bit vague, right? I wanna see more clarity, more specificity regarding to what um, ISO as an organization is really looking to achieve. And then um, through that, figuring out what are the actual measurable goals the organization is looking to, to accomplish. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah. I think that, that, that those are my, my big points. Thank you. Sarah, anything you'd like to add? 
Um, just a short note, um, I'll echo what Ebony already um, included about transparency in the um, um, makeup of the organization, both in audiences and artists and staff and board. Um, so, um, but also the work that's being done through the Catalyst Fund and DEIB plans um, beyond representation. So my questions were, um, you know, in the the um, how that was being applied in some programs was very um, thorough, but it was not thorough in all the programs. So my question was, are they applying those strategies across all of their programs? And if so, um, that would have been great to hear. And if not, why not? Um, why is it only some programs and not others? And similarly, um, great um, to have the DEI consultants that they're working with that are um, uh, national. Um, so my question was, are they also working with any local partners in that regard um, and in any advisory capacity? That's it for me. Great, thank you. Any additional comments? Great, if there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. Okay, our next uh, request is from Indianapolis Museum of Art doing business as New Fields. New Fields enriches lives through exceptional experiences with art and nature. They were founded in 1883. They have a 2022 operating income of 33,565,577. They have 49 board members, 243 full-time employees, the audience served in 2022 was 595,544. Um, and with that, I will ask Ray to begin the discussion. Great, thank you. Um, I thought this was interesting. It's the only organization after I re reviewed it and looked at it, I opened up my phone to take a break and their ads started popping up everywhere. So clearly their marketing scheme is working as I'm a state away. Um, so this is their 140th anniversary that they will kick off May 15th, and they have a whole series of events um, to mark that, and uh, the, the organization is moving forward with DEIA integrated focus throughout the entire organization under new leadership, um, including this year they will have 16 special exhibitions, and some of those will specifically address inequity and social justice as they promised. Um, they offer a handful of programs meant to ensure that everyone can participate in museum activities, um, including a partnership program that provides 50,000 free and discounted tickets to partners each year. Um, I would encourage them to look at the term of access again and uh, broaden that definition when we're thinking about partners. They, as part of their DEIA plan, they've included a build better relation, steps to build better relations in the community with the traditional uh, museum history, including a community advisory board and listening session with community engagement specialists. So trying to adapt to the changing um, demographics and audience. Their education programs seem pretty typical um, in trying to develop new and repeat audiences. They've been strategically updating operations and leadership model of the, over, of the organization overall. And they have been working on balancing their budget without using uh, or relying on their endowment all positive signs of a healthy organization. But by the numbers, DEI seems to continue to need to be a priority. And that's all for today. Great, thank you. Ebony, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, I, I just would like to kind of talk a bit about the strategic plan um, that they presented. Um, I think that, uh, it would have been nice to have a numerical time frame for the inclusivity goals section of the organization. Um, because the strategic plan is set for 10 years of time, um, it would have been kind of interesting to see, I mean, 10 years is a really long time. So it would have just been a little bit interesting to see um, what were your 
within that 10 years, what's two to three years that you're looking to do? What's the five to seven year range that you're looking to accomplish? Um, again, just to have more accountability um, in incremental spans of time as opposed to over, over uh, 10 years. Um, I think it's really exciting to see what happens under the tenure of Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett. Um, I think the organization is on the right track and working toward really fostering uh, diverse participants and audiences. Um, I would just say that uh, as Ray kind of uh, mentioned that the organization being predominantly white, um, uh, just having an openness and willingness to really learn um, and while also making sure you're doing that kind of very intentional work and in fostering diverse voices like the CEO, um, artists and community members um, and really kind of creating a space that is inclusive and welcoming to uh, diverse um, demographics and thought. Great, thank you. Any other panel comments? Great, if there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. Okay, we are flying through. Our last organization um, is a request from the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. Their mission is to create extraordinary learning experiences across the arts, sciences, and humanities that have the power to transform the lives of children and families. They were founded in 1952, uh, they had a 2022 operating income of $38,929,192. They have 35 board members, uh, 229 full-time employees, and their audience served in 2022 as 1,019,133. And with that, I will ask um, Cheney to read out Rochelle's comments. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Michelle begins by saying, this museum is a powerful community icon, the largest children's museum in the world. It makes clear that it understands and lives up to its purpose and lives up to the commitment to diversity. The migrated programming reflects the community in a way that should be emulated. Maintaining its mission to be devoted exclusively to its interests of young people, while also continually evolves to ensure its vitality, popularity, and educational prowess. The museum's initial collection of 600 community donated objects reflects a cultural diversity that happens when an entire community is involved. Now it hosts more than 1,300 objects, including the world's largest permanent installation of the Dale Chihuly blown glass, along with the National Art Museum of Sports Collection, which features a thousand works of fine art, and also the world's largest collection of dinosaur imagery. This museum has provided a group, excuse me, this museum has pr provided a blueprint for educationally sound programming and creative engagement with 15 permanent, 14 temporary exhibitions and a professional children, children's theater. The museum offers a well-rounded creative experience that has been rarely matched around this country. The leadership that have, has resulted in this so many groundbreaking and necessary programming is to be commended. And then she brings up the Emmett Till exhibition that was recently um, showcased. Teaching children American history, the good, the bad, and the ugly can be fraught with problems. What the museum did with the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley, let the world see traveling exhibition that was produced by the Till family and the Emmett Till Interpretive Center is one of the best endeavors ever undertaken to ensure that children are not shielded from the truth of American history. This exhibition tells the story of Emmett Till and his mother's courageous decision to show the world what Emmett's murderers had done to her son. This exhibition features an original film, sound, and light show. Bravo, bravo. Rochelle, excuse me. <clears throat> Rochelle closes with saying, the museum's budgeting and community outreach are not surprising for such a vital tourist and education and creative attraction. The long-term solid financial plans employed by the museum makes it easier to engage and create programming for a diverse audience. And she again says, a stellar application. Great, thank you. Sarah, anything you'd like to add? Well, that was pretty thorough, but um, I'll, I'll just try to add a few things and make sure I don't repeat. Um, um, I, it, I thought it was remarkable the, the steps that the museum is taking um, with stakeholder consultation, especially with um, neighborhood residents. Um, that was really great to read about. Um, and uh, focus on universal design and accessibility. Um, the 
Application mentions briefly that the museum administers access pass, and I know there's some pretty big numbers associated with access pass. I would have liked a little bit more um, details of how the program works and, um, you know, how we're, uh, how the museum is um, uh, focused on being welcoming um, to the um, community members that are using the access pass. Um, also wanted to just note, um, Rochelle already covered the Emmett Hill exhibition, so I wanted to note also the Art of Protest um, exhibition. I thought that was really um, remarkable where families can learn about the art and the artist and um, content that they may not have encountered otherwise with the, assist with the assistance of interpretive materials and um, to, to really help the parents or caregivers discuss it with their families. So I, I was excited to read about that. And um, one final note that I wanted to add, um, uh, I thought uh, I thought it was really great uh, to read about um, the steps included in the DEAI strategies um, beyond um, what we often see in those strategies was included repatriation. I thought that was really important. Um, um, specific goals set for projects over um, a $1 million budget and the vendor code of conduct um, that they talk about in the application. Um, so just wanted to uh, note those as well, especially the repa repatriation included in those strategies. I thought was really notable. That's it for me. Great, thank you. Any additional comments? I just want to uh, thank the applicants for all of their hard work and apologize to them for my having to miss a lot of this, but I did send the comments and I hope that uh, everyone took them in the spirit that they were intended and thank this panel. This is an amazing, amazing way to do this. So thanks. Thank you, Rochelle. Any other comments? Great. If there are no further comments, please update your scores in the system if needed. As previously announced, all scores will be kept confidential. And this concludes the 2023 Annual Grants Program panel. I want to give a huge thank you to all of our panelists and our grant applicants. We will have the recordings of these panel reviews available on our YouTube channel. Um, as a reminder, grant applicants will be notified of their awards by Friday, May 5th. Shortly following the 2023 award announcements, the Arts Council will launch an evaluation process to inform potential annual grants program design changes, similar to our work with arts leaders in 2019 to co-create the current evaluation criteria. In early May, a survey will be sent to all organization leaders and grants, grants contacts, and we will also host several feedback forums to assess the program. Thank you all. I hope you all have a great weekend. Panelists, please stay on. <laughs>